Thank you for that build-up, Ed. My mother would be extremely proud. Um, nobody else but my mother. Um, you said a very really interesting thing. You said that the government uh, understands uh, branding, which I agree it does, and I, I think the great campaign is a great campaign. But I just make observation that it needs continuous refreshing. It'll be something I'll refer, return to in a minute. Continuous refreshing as you, as you develop branding, because one of the things that, that we know uh, consistency might be the hobgoblin of small minds, um, but it is extremely important in branding. Now, I, I'm going to take uh, a, 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 a moment just to run through. This is not an unashamed ad for WPP, but it, it does show because I was struck by the um, founder of uh, Legend and Lenovo talking about 10 people. Uh, we had two people 27 years ago uh, in, uh, in a square in London. Uh, and we built the company, as you can see, over uh, 27 years. Uh, it has been a bumpy ride. It has not been a uh, straight line up from left to right. And we've gone through three recessions. The first recession was in 91, 1991. The second was in 2001, 2002. And the deepest, probably, was 2008. But I would just make the observation that it's really interesting that we are now back, 2011 was a record year for us, and we are now back beyond where we were pre layman And I think that tells you two things. The first is that in mature markets such as the UK, the US, and Western continental Europe, our clients are investing in brands. They might not be investing in capacity because of uncertainties around demand generation, but they are investing in brands to maintain and increase market share. And the second thing is that outside those mature markets, in the fast-growing markets, and I don't call them emerging markets, it's an insult to China to say to China they are an emerging market. They are the second largest market in the world. America, just to remind you, is 15 trillion out of 65 trillion. China is about 7 trillion. Still half the size in dollar terms, but the second biggest market. It's bigger than Japan. Uh, but in those faster-growing markets, What's happening is that our clients are investing in capacity, and behind that, they're investing in brand. Now, what's interesting, I just threw up market cap. We went from a market cap of one, one million pounds to now 10 billion pounds, 16 billion dollars. But it has been bumpy as well. And what's interesting about this chart, it, it reflects what's happened to the equity markets in the Western world since the year 2000, since the, since the internet bust of 2001 and 2002. Now, I just want, want to dwell for a second on our strategy. Our strategy is very simple. It's new markets, such as China. It's new media, such as digital. It's consumer insight, which is about understanding how consumers are consuming products and services. And last but not least, it's what we call horizontality. I don't think there is such a word in the English language. There might be in Chinese. But what it means is getting people to work together, not reinventing the wheel. We have 160,000 people now around the world in 108 countries. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important in terms of getting the best value. Now, in terms of, um, of who our clients are, the, these are our top 30 accounts. They account for about uh, 5 billion out of 17 billion, 5.5 billion out of $17 billion of revenue this year. We manage a media book of 75 billion. That's the media billings. But you can see our biggest client is Ford Motor Company, our second big, biggest is Procter & Gamble, and our third biggest uh, is, is Unilever. These are our biggest Chinese clients, and these are Chinese clients based, obviously, in China. And I should say that our Chinese business now is our third largest business. So the United States is about $6.5 billion of revenue. The UK is about $2.5 billion. And China this year will be 1.3 billion. And we're very proud of our Chinese business. We have 14,000 people there. And we, have eight, we operate in 80 cities. Now, that's actually dwarfed by the number of cities in China that have more than 1 million people, which is ultimately where we want to be. But I wanted just to underline that too many people think of China as the coastal region of Beijing and Shanghai. It's not. And certainly, government policy, whether it be the 12th five-year plan or previous five-year plans, have stressed the importance of the development of the hinterland, and particularly of the West, 
And I was with, with for example, the delegation from Nanjing, where the Youth Games in 2014 will be, where we will be, uh, the agency we've recently acquired, Yingdu in Nanjing, will be helping the government, the provincial government, with the Youth Games. But those are our, our Chinese clients. And these are our multinational clients, which follow pretty much what we see outside with Ford, Unilever, and Procter Gamble. These are our multinational clients that are growing uh, in China. And I'm going to come back that, to that in a second. And there again in, in iPad form is, uh, are our top 30 clients. Now, I, what, what we did, um, partly in honor of uh, the government's initiative, which I, I should applaud, actually, is somebody in the private sector. It's rare that governments have done uh, as the UK government has done here, really a business Olympics at the same time as we have a sporting Olympics. I think it's a tremendous opportunity. With my colleague David Roth there, who's in the front row, we have, we have done this top 50 Chinese brands uh, survey. Well, I'll just explain a little bit. With the Financial Times every year, we value the world's brands, uh, multinationally, globally. We do the top 100 brands, uh, overall and by, by segment and sector. And we thought it would be a good idea not just because of this occasion, but, but for other reasons, to look at the most valuable brands. Now, before anybody in the audience who is not included in this survey gets excited or upset, let me say that we focus on consumer brands. So Huawei should not be upset because it's an enterprise brand. The more consumer-facing brand it has, the better it will be. And don't get particularly exercised as to where your relative positions are. What we're trying to do is to get Chinese companies to think more about branding. And Ian mentioned this intangibility issue. And I think one of the biggest challenges in China, if I can be so bold, um, I'd probably be braver saying this in London than I would in Beijing or Shanghai. One, one of the issues in China is convincing Chinese state-owned enterprises uh, at SASAC, and I have competition out there. It happened yesterday, too. Um, that's the trouble about being in London uh, at the time of the Olympics. The bands are playing. Um, but we have with SASAC and we have with private enterprises tried to condition the leaders of those companies, the chairman, the vice chairman, the, the CEOs, we tried to condition them to thinking more about these intangible issues that Ian mentioned. It's very difficult to get one's mind around this. And I'll come back to this in a minute. It's particularly difficult in China. So you can see this, by the way, you can see this survey at brandz.com, or what the, the Americans call brandz, what the English call brandz.com. Now, th this is really important, and if there's one thing that I'd like you to remember, it's this. This compares the stock markets, the average for the stock markets, against the brandz top Chinese brand portfolio and then their total shareholder return performance over the last year or so. And you can see that there's been significant outperformance by those companies that have invested in their brand and have strong brands, as opposed to the general indices. And this works whether you look at Chinese brands, we've done it for Latin American brands as well, in Brazil and Mexico and Colombia and Argentina and Chile. It works as well for global as well. If we take the portfolio of the top 100 black brands that we identify with the Financial Times each year and compare it to market performance, they outperform. So investing in brands, there is a correlation, and Deutsche Bank actually have done some wonderful analysis on the fact that those companies that invest in brands consistently over time, that don't chop and change, that are consistent in their approach, always do, they always outperform. And the cost of getting back if you cut is far greater than if you, that you stay in the course. Uh, and these are, the, are China's 50 top brands, according to ourselves. They are worth 325 billion US dollars. They grew last year alone by 16% in value, and they are equal to 5% of China's uh, GDP. Now, I, I want to sort of just focus a little bit on how some of those companies uh, of, are building their, bri their brands. And I want to give you some examples of different strategies. And the first is innovation. You would expect in China and indeed elsewhere, innovation to be key, because there are two key things that our clients have to deal with, geography and technology. I, I believe, that may sound a simple thing to say, but I believe that everything that we do eventually comes down to geography and technology. And here is a, a technological example. We have Charles Chow here. 
uh, and Sina uh, has developed, uh, which is a web portal, so similar to a Yahoo or to some extent a, Ga a Google or a Twitter, uh, and also active in e-commerce, really changed, I think, to some extent the way consumers felt about it by the launch of Weibo, which is a microblog, so it's a Twitter uh, look-alike in a way. It was launched in 2009. It has 227 million users. It has 86 million messages posted daily, and I know Charles is going to tell me that my numbers are out of date as of yesterday, and it's a, it's a bigger number. So innovation is critical first. A second strategy is on trust, and that's to fuel bonding. And I'm going to come back to bonding in a second, because Chinese companies are very good at awareness, but they aren't as good as they should be, in our view, on bonding. On, on consumers loving brands. Chinese consumers tend to love multinational brands more than they do Chinese brands. They're more aware of Chinese brands, as I'll come on to show, but they don't have this bonding that we talk about uh, in the analysis that we do. And there are two good examples of this. Number 47 uh, on, on our list, which is an oil uh, and rice company, and then uh, Meng Nui, which is more, more colloquially known as Mongolian cow, which has had a lot of challenges on trust with the consumer, but have tried to build bonding uh, with, with the consumer. So that's a second way of doing it. A third way, as you would expect, with a civilization as deep and as historic as China, is heritage. And two great examples of, of this is Mao Tai, which is, a, which is a premium alcohol product on the left-hand side, and a herbal remedy product on the right-hand side, another example of a very strong Chinese brand, valued, as you can see, in the top right-hand corner at $9 billion uh, and $1 billion, two examples at numbers 13 and 36, two examples of companies that have used a heritage strategy to position and develop their products. Uh, and, and the fourth, I'm kind of come back to technology, is the digital evolution. And the really interesting thing about Chinese brands is just like the global survey that we do, four of the top global five brands are technology brands, like Google, Apple, and Amazon. And similarly, when you look at the Chinese top brands, and here you can see numbers 1, 6, 40, 35, 25, 10, 11, 15, all of them, are, are uh, technology brands. China Mobile, you know, it's the world's most valuable brand outside the United States. Has been consistently in the top 10 of the global brands that we, former Chairman Wang, whenever I see him at any conference like this, always comes up to me and says, Martin, are we still in the, in the, the top brands in the world? And China Mobile has 650 million subscribers on their network, the most powerful network in the world. Other companies such as uh, Baidu, which is a Google lookalike, if I can put it like this. Uh, number 40 is a travel site. Uh, another portal, Renren, uh, at number 35. Sina, I've always mentioned, uh, already mentioned, given Charles too much publicity already. Tencent, uh, a gaming and instant messaging uh, company. China Telecom and China Unicom, two more telecom companies that are well known. And what's really interesting also is that non-technology companies, or companies that you wouldn't associate naturally with technology, are also using the digital evolution to develop their brands. One brand that you would think, you would, you would automatically think would probably go this route would be Hire, a domestic appliance brand which has become an extremely powerful brand now internationally. It's one of the world's, like Huawei, like Lenovo, it's one of the world's international Chinese brands. And then maybe a slightly different one, Snow Beer, Snow Leopard, as it's known, uh, on the right-hand side is similar. Now, let me just talk a little bit about the challenges to brand growth for Chinese brands going forward. And I think this is the critical point. Uh, one, of our, one of our agencies is J. Walter Thompson, the guy who runs that uh, in China and in Southeast Asia is Tom Dokteroff. And he's written a book, uh, it's one of the number of books that have been on China called Billions. A, there are billions of books called Billions on China. But Tom has written a book, and what he describes there is pretty much what's in this, this slide. And let me just try and encapsulate it for you. Chinese brands are very good at getting distribution. Chinese brands are very good at awareness. Chinese brands' price points tend to be low price points. 
Multinational brands tend to be very good at getting loyalty. Chinese consumers love an LVMH, a Prada, or a Gucci. They love uh, the, a Nike brand. But they don't have great awareness. Those that do know of it, love it, but there isn't great awareness, and they don't have great distribution, and they have very high price points. And the battle that is taking place, if I can call it a battle, is that the Chinese companies are now starting to understand a little bit more the value of what Ian mentioned of intangible branding and are starting to brand more aggressively the price and move up the price line and not forget about distribution but start to try and build a relationship with the consumer through new media and through legacy media, free-to-air television and the like, CCTV and the like, in a more aggressive way. And the multinational companies are lowering their price points are uh, becoming more attuned to the local needs of the market, moving down market and focusing more on distribution. You know, we have a number of distribution companies in China. One of the reasons we have, uh, well, I say we have 14,000 people. If I included the part-time people we had, have in China, probably be up to almost 100,000. We have distribution sales forces going all around China, just like we have in India, actually, in the rural communities distributing products. So one issue is, price points, distribution, and awareness versus loyalty uh, and pricing and premium pricing. And the other issue which is fundamental to this conference is knowledge. People, the simple fact is this. People outside China don't know Chinese brands. And we've just done a little bit of analysis here. And you can see, for example, in the UK, if you ask the question, can you name any Chinese brand, very few, if any, consumers can similar position in the US. Interestingly, in Australia, it's quite high, which when you really think about it is probably understandable. It's higher in, in, in markets such as South Africa and is certainly higher in India. But getting consumers outside China to know Chinese brands is extremely important. Having said that, there is no other country on the planet, maybe with the exception of India, that has such a large and vibrant and growing domestic market. The Chinese have 1.3 billion potential consumers. In fact, I, uh, I remember sitting next to the Communist Party secretary who said we may have 1.5 billion consumers. I don't think the Chinese census has been completed yet, and it may actually reveal that there are 1.5 billion people in China. Now, if you think about that for a second, it's 200 million people more than we thought, which is three and a half UKs, two thirds of a US, and almost in Indonesia which is quite staggering. So you could make the argument that Chinese companies should focus more on domestic market, saturate that, and then think about going abroad. Chairman Wang of China T Telecom bought Pactel. Pactel was 10 million consumers. That is two months additional subscribers in China, because China Mobile grows by five million a month. So why bother is a strategy or an argument that I think I would accept on the other hand, at some point in time, it will be, it will be important. I, I would just finally uh, salute, on behalf of WPP, and indeed on behalf of uh, the UK, China's top 50 brands, which we have. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.